Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Senator Yuen Pa Wu, Senator for British Columbia in the Senate of Canada. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the virtual Victoria Forum session on financial inclusion. Wherever you're joining us from, and I understand we have participants from many parts of the globe in many different time zones, I want to thank you for being part of what I'm sure will be a very, very interesting, illuminating discussion and one which we hope will provide some pathways forward in terms of improving financial inclusion in Canada and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this session is broken into two parts. The first panel will be on open banking as a solution to financial inclusion with a particular focus on Canada. And the second panel, starting in about an hour, will look at the narrow issue, if I can put it that way, of small money transfers or remittances uh, as another solution to financial inclusion, particularly in developing regions around the world. Obviously, the two topics are closely linked, and uh, we, will, we will try to create that linkage between the first and the second panels. And I do hope that all of you can join us uh, for the entirety of our discussion. I want to just start by uh, describing what are some of the key concepts that we'll be discussing today, because I suspect that many of you may be new to the idea of financial inclusion and open banking and some other jargon that likely will be used extensively through this session. And if I could start with uh, the one I've already used a number of times, which is financial inclusion. What do we mean by financial inclusion? Well, there are many definitions, of course, but uh, basically it's about uh, the, the objective of making it possible for individuals as well as businesses to have access to useful, affordable financial products and services that meet their needs. And this would cover the range of financial products and services, including transactions, payments, savings, credit, insurance, and so on and so forth. But of course, uh, in the case of um, developing countries in particular, all of these have to be delivered in a way that is uh, responsible, sustainable, and ultimately uh, affordable. Uh, the question of financial inclusion often is connected to the role of fintech, a term that has been widely used and which is going to be cited many times in this discussion. And many of us have um, a, an impression of what fintech is, but let me just uh, belabor the point that it is simply the use of technology, new technology, I suppose, that seeks to improve and to automate the delivery and use of financial services. Needless to say, fintech can be a very powerful tool to improve financial inclusion, but it is not simply a tool for financial inclusion. It's also about a tool to improve the efficiency of the financial services uh, sector. And finally, to another term that will form the theme of this first panel, uh, the idea of open banking. What do we mean by open banking? Well, again, multiple definitions out there, but in general, we are referring to a framework which will give customers access to and control over their financial data. Uh, this access and control over financial data <coughs> allows consumers to then direct banks to securely share only the financial data that they choose for the duration that they choose for the purposes that they choose. And one of the tools that is uh, key to the success of open banking, another term you will hear, I'm sure, in the course of our discussion is application programming interfaces, APIs. These are programs that scrape data uh, from, uh, from information that's provided often by the major traditional providers and which then make it available to other, uh, other platforms. Uh, 
we'll have more discussion on all of these concepts and uh, I want to now uh, plunge into our discussion uh, which is on the issue of open banking in Canada as a tool for financial inclusion. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel consisting of um, advocates, legislators, regulators, uh, bankers and former bankers and I'm really delighted to invite our first speaker uh, who is Martin Rona. He is the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. He is based, I believe, in Holland. And I want to start by asking you, Martin, if you would, uh, well, agree with my definitions, but more importantly, uh, tell us what you think is the value proposition of open banking for consumers. And how, how would open banking, in fact, enhance financial inclusion? Martin. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Senator Wu. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again at the Victoria Forum. Um, I should maybe clarify that I'm probably not a total specialist in open banking nor on Canada because I'm based, uh, I'm actually based in Switzerland, but it's true our organization is based in the Netherlands. Um, I represent the global network of banks which focus on social and environmental impact. And so um, my look at um, open banking and at uh, these new technologies coming up are really through the lens of financial inclusion, but primarily in emerging markets. Uh, I should maybe add that in my previous life, I was chief executive of a Swiss bank and had um, the pleasure of implementing API technology uh, with all the advantages, but also the downside. So um, I, I have a bit of a balanced view um, uh, in that respect. Um, if we look at what um, uh, this means for consumers in general, I think um, open banking and uh, these new technologies that are um, making, um, uh, making use of open banking, they, they do bring a lot of advantages. First of all, there's the aspect of convenience uh, for consumers because um, you will have much more convenient solutions which are much more uh, really uh, serving the needs of, of uh, whoever uses these applications. Um, you might have additional functionality because you can integrate extra programs. For example, you can link your bank uh, account directly to an accounting software, etc. cetera. Um, you will have uh, much more competition, therefore price will come down, um, uh, there will be more choice. So at least in theory, it seems really good. And I guess during this um, um, seminar, we will be able to explore also the risks a little further. Now looking at financial inclusion, um, I think at least as far as emerging markets go, I'm quite excited about the possibility that the technology offers because um, again, it's, it can be very cheap um, in emerging markets, for example, the transactions are very small. So um, you have to have a technology that's extre extremely efficient and cheap. Um, the technology is very accessible. So you have these remote rural areas where you don't have any bank branch, but people might have a smartphone so they can access a bank or banking services better, I should say banking services through, um, through this technology. Um, you can build in features that um, enhance financial literacy, um, that, that help um, people understand what finance means. Uh, you can even build a credit history by having maybe certain tracking devices, et cetera, that show what the, uh, the way is, uh, how people actually are using um, their, their, their finances. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there. But again, I think there are also risks, and especially from a point of view of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, what we look at are these um, solutions primarily being, what, what are the, the values that are behind the solutions? What are driving them? Are they primarily for profit or is it also for social impact? And um, I think that's where it becomes quite difficult uh, to distinguish whether it's really a benefit or whether it might be actually a risk in the long term. Thank you, Martin. And if I could just uh, probe a little bit further before we move to our second panelist, um, you've mentioned the importance of financial inclusion in uh, in developing regions. 
uh, your organization is focused on financial inclusion. And you, of course, live in a very industrialized, very rich country, as, as I do, and all of us, uh, many of us uh, on this panel do. Uh, can you just say a little bit about uh, the challenge of financial inclusion, even in industrialized countries, and how big of a problem is that? Um, I think it depends in um, uh, where you go. Um, for example, we have some banks in the United States which do incredible work around financial inclusion because um, you have really um, a huge percentage of the um, U.S. population that does not have the kind mm. of credit history that is needed to really access the financial system. And so they have to find workarounds to help those people get back into that formalized system, get a credit history. Um, it's probably more of an issue maybe in Northern America, North America. I know that, for example, one of our major um, uh, um, member banks, um, Ban City, is also very strong on issues around financial inclusion. So I think in Canada it must also be quite an important issue. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we will we will get back to North America soon enough. I'm really glad you've highlighted that financial inclusion is not just an issue for developing countries. It's also an issue for uh, some industrialized countries. But let me stay in uh, in the uh, the broader developing world for now and turn to Governor Abbasi, who is um, uh, has been a longtime champion and advocate and pioneer, if I can say that, in terms of advocating for fintech uh, as a tool of financial inclusion in Tunisia. He's, of course, the governor of the Central Bank of Tunisia. I wonder if Governor Abbasi could tell us a little bit about uh, the challenge of financial inclusion in Tunisia and the role of fintech and maybe open banking in addressing some of those challenges. Governor Abbasi. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, with you, and I, uh, uh, I really want to, to thank uh, Professor Gituni for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to be part of you. I think when we talk about uh, uh, financial inclusion, it's um, very, very important to, to say that uh, Tunisia, before the revolution in 2011, we were doing... Uh, quite good in uh, the uh, economic terms. Uh, we, for example, I, I, I can give you some indicators. I think the, the um, GDP growth was uh, for decades close to four to five percent in real term. And, uh, and uh, in 2008, uh, you know, it was the uh, big, uh, le let's say, crisis. And uh, I think Tunisia was impacted by this crisis, but uh, in 2010, uh, 11, uh, we've had this, uh, let's say, this revolution, what we call the Arab Spring, and uh, and uh, for uh, more than now, I think we are close to 10 years uh, after uh, after you know 2010 to 2011. I think we will have the uh, birth date of our revolution in in uh, in, uh, in 14 of January, and we will we will get to 10 years of the revolution. And I think one of the most important, uh, uh, let's say, uh, problem uh, faced, uh, we, we are facing in Tunisia is we've had 4 to 5% of growth, but it was not an inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. And we discovered that there's two Tunisia, one in the coast and the other one in what we call the internal, uh, uh, let's say, regions of Tunisia. And uh, we, we, we understood very well that uh, education was not, let's say, uh, I think uh, very well uh, uh, improved in, in the, what you call this uh, deep regions in Tunisia. And I think uh, now we are discovering, we've had uh, in, in the central bank, we, we, organ we, we organized ourselves to be sure that we can, uh, I think, improve this uh, financial inclusion. And I think uh, now we are uh, uh, doing great. Uh, I think we, we have, uh, with the Startup Act, uh, I think close to 350 uh, firms who uh, are now registered as, start, as a startup and uh, close to 70% of, uh, of fintechs and you are working in the central bank to, to develop uh, what we call this um, uh, uh, innovation lab and, uh, and uh, the sandbox, uh, sandbox uh, 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 regulatory uh, 
sandbox. And I think that's also is uh, giving us more opportunity to work with the fintechs and to develop our regulation. Because it's, uh, it's uh, you know very well that uh, the central banks, they are always, you know, trying also to, to be, uh, uh, le, 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 let's say, uh, uh, close to the banking system, but uh, we need also to 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 be sure that uh, we develop these fintechs and also to be sure that uh, we can better, uh, 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 I think, uh, move to these uh, population, the rural areas and the lagged regions, and uh, and to help and to 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 give them opportunities to be to be part of uh, of uh, you know the uh, formal economy because right now. And we discovered with the big, big pandemic and with COVID-19, we discovered that uh, we have a lot of goods. More than 700,000 people came to us and said, uh, we are here uh, because we, uh, we, we, uh, because during this March and April, etc., cetera, we, we, we stopped, you know, all the, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, I think it was the lockdown and we, we, we've had, you know, to, to give subsidies to these uh, to these people and we discovered that these people they were leaving without even uh, even uh, even uh, the the government was uh, able to uh, to help and to support them then i think that's also is part of what we discovered and with these fintechs we were able even uh, even to uh, through you know the uh, these uh, let's say the uh, digital payment we were able to to give uh, uh, funds to these people and uh, we discovered they are uh, 100 percent connected and that's also is part of what we are disco- discovering the there's there's no digital uh, let's say divide between uh, the poor people and the others and i think now with the digital payment we can uh, we can uh, uh, better uh, let's say serve this population and i think Financial inclusion is not uh, is not only uh, uh, let's say a title in uh, in in a study done by the central bank and others. Now we are trying to do is is uh, is uh, uh, to give the opportunities for our fintechs to help and to support the banking systems through the what we call the establishment of payment and others. Uh, let's say tools we are uh, we are uh, uh, putting you know on uh, on on the track and we and I I am sure right now that. Uh, we will be able to uh, uh, to reach this population and to give them the opportunity to be more formalized. That's what I think we are trying to do. Thank you, Governor. That was very, very interesting. And your point about uh, COVID's impact on the economy and on uh, individuals and households is a very key one in terms of the discussion around fintech because any programs that governments might dream up or uh, dream up and try to um, use to disburse funds to households uh, would not be possible if households do not have the means to receive those funds and you've made a very important point that fintech is a solution to the unbanked or those who do not have traditional ways of receiving uh, assistance it's very refreshing governor to hear as a central bank uh, such a senior central bank official being uh, so positive, if I can put it that way, on fintech. And I know you're being very prudent as well. And I suspect some of our panelists may have some questions for you. Uh, so we'll come back to you at uh, later in this panel. Uh, on the point of q and I would just in, uh, draw your attention, all of you in the audience, uh, that there is a Q&A button uh, in, on your screen. And I invite you to enter your questions, uh, which I will review shortly. I will try and set aside the last 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A, which I will uh, collate and uh, channel to the appropriate speakers. Uh, But before that, let me move to our third speaker, my colleague, uh, Senator Colin Deacon from Nova Scotia. He is a, a champion of open banking in this country and has done a lot of thinking and a lot of work uh, on this question. Uh, Colin, I wonder if you could give us a sense of the state of play of open banking in Canada and what are some of the major obstacles that are faced on the one hand by consumers, uh, on the other hand by by businesses uh, and, and how do fintechs play a role in solving some of these problems? Colin, please. Oh, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me today. It's uh, it's a real treat to be on a panel uh, moderated by you and and with the esteemed uh, uh, group of panelists that you pulled together. 
just say that I'm a, I'm a champion and I was really uh, interested to listen to Governor Alabasi uh, just speak about a, a very practical uh, situation. How do we make sure that we, in a way that is most effective for individuals, how does government distribute relief in a, in a rapid manner? And even in one of the most developed countries of the world, Canada, that was a massive challenge to get our initial COVID relief out in a way that could be received by Canadians. And so it's, you know, when I look at the, at, at where we're at in this country right now, um, just to answer your first question very specifically, I think we're, mm. we're we aspire to be fast followers. We've seen, uh, we've seen some initial indications in the last few weeks from the, uh, from the minister's uh, advisory panel on open banking that they can c- proceed with their uh, second phase consultations, which is on how do we move forward as a country, which was tremendous news. Uh, the change in finance minister for us was really important to make sure that we had a finance minister who was really committed to uh, making sure that, that, uh, that, that, that we made progress on this file. So that, that to me, I think we now are moving out of the element of aspiring to be fast followers to holding the potential of being fast followers. But that's just really quite recent news. Um, I look at the reason why that's important uh, really specifically relating to COVID. COVID has accelerated the need for open banking, I think, globally. And the reason I say that is that, that uh, traditional ways of, of providing credit, access to credit, the traditional metrics used. Uh, I was watching a panel uh, a week or so ago uh, from Canadian Lenders Association, and it reaffirmed data that I, I have uh, had the Library of Parliament summarize from the Philadelphia Fed. And the data were very, very specific. The statement that was made is that there's been a myth that there's a very tight correlation between credit risk and income and wealth or income or wealth. And what's really interesting is the the data from the, the Philadelphia Fed have shown that fintech lenders used to be very financial technology companies that lend funds to individuals used to have a a way of assessing credit risk that really uh, aligned very clearly in the United States to the FICO scores and other traditional means used by banks. That was around 2005, 2006 through 2008. That has since completely changed. And the alternative data that they look at find within the unbanked or underbanked population invisible prime borrowers, to use their term. These are individuals that do not uh, represent to a bank using traditional me- metrics a good credit risk. They're uncredit worthy. But to a financial technology lender using alternative data, they are a good tr- credit risk. They're looking at different things. Uh, to assess the credit. And they're finding great success in that. And to me, if we're going to be able to provide individuals who've been most severely hit coming out of COVID with the ability to use their brain and their ability and their determination when they don't, they no longer have assets or, or an income to start to rebuild, to empower our entrepreneurs and, and individuals just, just to rebuild their lives or create their own jobs, we are going to have to be able to make sure that they have access to credit. Well, it's, can it's, I? Yeah, go ahead, please. No, I, I want to pick up on that because you are a serial entrepreneur yourself. So you know a little bit about what you, what you say. And you've described a problem where, which you think fintech can solve. But can you tell me how big this problem is? What, what are we missing out in not having uh, an open banking approach where fintechs using alternative data can provide credit to people who are not currently able to get credit. What are we missing out here? Well, we've seen in our small business lending since Basel II, the big banks have had to move away from this small business lending for the most part. It's just that it just was not a profitable business line for them. And that is fine. I don't say that in a way that it is any way negative towards our banks. It's just a fact of the regulatory environment in which in, within which they live. That has birthed a whole group of small business lenders that are financial technology companies that love that space. Yes, they lend at a higher rate, 
but it's a lower rate that it is it, number one it's credit and it's lower than than some less uh uh um <laughs> Ones you wouldn't want to have. Got it. Got it. I got it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I tried to figure out how do I, you know, anyway. Yes. Vultures. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Good word. Uh, so they have in Canada, billions of dollars have been lent out by financial technology lenders to small business because they provided a value system and the ability to provide training and support to those small businesses on a, on a very targeted basis that enabled success. And you, and you read some of the stories and look at the data that they've, in terms of the success they've enabled small business to achieve is fantastic. But our COVID response, as you know, in Canada, we, the, the previous finance minister was firm in deciding that he did not want to include financial technology lenders in providing the small business uh, relief that they that, that they, 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 through them, uh, only through financial institutions. For me, that was a really sad moment because not only did it mean that a small business had to go to a financial institution that wouldn't serve them before to get access to the federal relief, but it meant that the, that the fintech itself that had taken on this challenge was put at a competitive disadvantage relative to the financial institutions and a competitive disadvantage relative to foreign competitors in the same space. So to me, that's, you know, that was really troubling. And, that's, and that is the opportunity that if we can take advantage of is really significant. I'd offer Thank just, go ahead. Yes, please, no, please finish up, uh, Senator. I'd offer just going back to uh, uh, Gov Governor uh, Alabasi's point about pay techs. Payment technology companies can be incredibly successful in reducing fraud rates because they can, they, they can often, you don't need to have a piece of plastic anymore to distribute it can all the entire payment technology can exist on a smartphone that provides an ability to assess uh, the 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 appropriateness or the authenticity of a, of a of a transaction far more rapidly in a very personalized way using uh, artificial intelligence that can dramatically reduce fraud rates around credit card use. It can provide individuals with access to to funds immediately. They don't have to go with a, <laughs> the old traditional way in Canada with a check to your bank. And then eventually the bank, you know, fortunately with government of Canada, they didn't put a whole period on of two weeks, but, you know, immediate access to funds. And that is really, really powerful to those in greatest need. The other th element is, that's really important in my mind is that those who are in greatest need tend to be underbanked or unbanked. And when they are underbanked, it means they're probably paying the highest percentage of their income or their cash available in fees relative to others, because they're that just the nature of the system. They're not a profitable customer for the banks, and so they have to pay a relative share. That that can change dramatically using payment technologies, the pay tax. So you know, there's a whole lot of social issues that are addressed through using the use of this new technology. If it's in, going back to, again, to something Governor Alabasi said, if it's, and, and, and was said also by Mr. Rohner, if it's in the right regulatory regime. Right. And that's a great cue for our next um, panelist. But I also want to say that you've also set up a nice segue for our next panel, which starts in about uh, half an hour, 35 minutes on uh, money transfers, cross-body money transfers, remittances, and the use of payment technology, including the role of um, payments organizations. So those of you who have a special interest in that issue, make sure you don't log off after this panel. A lot more to come. Uh, we've had a number of references to regulators, the importance of uh, appropriate regulation. I, I want to, first of all, absolve you, um, uh, Madam Wright, of any responsibility. You do not regulate this industry as such, and that's not what we're going to we're not going to put that burden on you, but you do play a very key role in the Competition Bureau. And we'd like to hear your thoughts on the kind of regulatory regime that would address the concerns that Mr. Rona has expressed and Senator Deacon and Governor Alabasi. And just give us your thoughts in general on how Canada in the first instance, or you can have a broader discussion if you like, but how Canada... Uh, can uh, set up the appropriate regulatory regime for open banking. Over to you. 
Thanks very much, Senator Wu. And let me begin just by saying thank you very much for the invitation to um, be part of this panel today. Open banking and uh, fostering competition and innovation in the financial services market has been something that we have been very interested in for quite a long time at the Competition Bureau. And it's just very heartening to see that these types of conversations are continuing between government regulators as well as, um, as, as, well as private businesses. Um, so the question that you pose is, how do we create the appropriate regulatory framework for open banking to be a success in Canada? And if I use my competition lens on that question, I would say that the appropriate regulatory framework is one that enables companies to take advantage of innovative business models while at the same time respecting our federalist system. So uh, if only real life were as simple as that one line response there. Um, and our federalist system is certainly a challenge. Um, to give you a bit of a sense of, of how challenging it is for business owners, um, I thought I'd share with you a story. About three years ago, we published a large report on how to foster innovation in financial services. Um, and we went around and gave presentations to a number of different stakeholders about the findings of our report. And I had a PowerPoint presentation. And one of the slides in that PowerPoint presentation had kind of an overview of all of the different stakeholders with whom we had engaged during our study. And during my presentation, uh, a business entrepreneur raised their hand and said, you know, there's one number on that page that just terrifies me. And that's the number 17. And that was the number of regulators with whom we had engaged during our, our, our market study. Um, you know, as a business entrepreneur who's trying to set up shop in Canada, the idea of having to engage with 17 different regulators across a very large country and having to ensure that your business model meets all of those different requirements, I, I am sure is an extremely overwhelming thought. Um, so then going back to my very simple uh, answer, which was let's just create a system um, that allows for innovation that also, you know, accepts the fact that we're part of a federalist system. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, one idea is to essentially get regulators to start singing from the same songbook. One of the things that the Competition Bureau has been doing over the past six months is we've put together something called a competition assessment. And this is a very practical step-by-step -step guide on how regulators and policymakers across the country at all levels of government can, can, can make competition part of their analysis. So when they're developing frameworks and when they're developing the policies, they can ask themselves, how are these policies going to impact competition? Um, and how can we minimize that impact on competition? And how can we maybe even foster the competition in the marketplace through the policies that we're developing? Um, so I'll leave it there. If, if anyone has any questions about the Competition Assessment Toolkit, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's something that we love talking about and something that we're hoping will we'll get a lot of pickup and a lot of interest. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. That was very helpful indeed. And I want to pick up on the issue of the appropriate regulatory framework and what the right questions are to ask in coming up with this framework. I want to ask our other panelists now to circle back to your comments and see what the, what their thoughts are in terms of how to craft the right regulatory framework that is pro-competitive, of course, and which uh, which um, facilitates, if I can say that, uh, the advancement of fintechs. And maybe I can start with uh, Governor El Abbasi, because you also are directly dealing with an exploding um, ecosystem of fintechs in your country. What, what are the challenges you face in terms of regulating them, making sure that um, nothing goes awry because things could go very bad if, um, if they're not properly managed? Governor? Yeah, I, I think um, 
It's not it's not an easy task, uh, uh, as you know. The 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 the, the tra- central banks are uh, normally very conservative, and I remember uh, uh, I was invited two years ago with the Bank of International Settlement, and and I rem- I, I, I I remember the discussion two years ago about the fintechs, about the uh, what we call the CBDC and uh, crypto money, etc. It was. Uh, for them, um, new it was uh, it was uh, disruptive. It was, uh, but the uh, I think uh, one year after, we've had a real change. And I I I I, uh, uh, I, I remember a very very tough discussion between uh, you know uh, Madame Lagarde and uh, and some of these uh, young guys uh, uh, fighting for the crypto money etc. in uh, in uh, in the IMF. I think right now uh, in in Tunisia, what we are trying to do is to is uh, is uh, to to bring to our doors, let's say, these uh, fintechs. And uh, uh, for example, what we are trying to do with uh, with the reg- regulatory uh, sandbox is, uh, for example, we have um, two or three uh, uh, very important topics. For example, the uh, what we call the cross border payment, the instant payment. For example, uh, the digital payment, the uh, EQYC, uh, all these problems we are facing right now, and we think that it's very important for us, perhaps to change our uh, regulatory uh, framework, but at the same time to understand from these uh, uh, young uh, uh, engineers uh, in our doors and to give them the data, just to be sure that they can use the data, understand, and uh, and uh, uh, and give us, you know, the uh, the say let's say these bring the technologies in our uh, let's say with our uh, uh, colleagues in the central bank, but also to better understand what they are doing. And I think uh, uh, this discussion is very important, you know, not outside the central bank, but inside the central bank. For example, we are talking about blockchain, we are t- talking about uh, artificial intelligence, etc. We don't have the right experts inside, you know, to understand, you know, all these technologies. But bringing these uh, engineers and uh, all of lot of these engineers, they are they they have very large experience. They they are coming also from the diaspora, with 15 years uh, or 20 years experience back to Tunis, uh, uh, having the possibility to work with uh, uh, young young uh, uh, Tunisian engineers and bringing, uh, you know, in the country this diaspora, this and uh, this what we call this. Uh, and uh, inside intelligence uh, in the central bank and uh, and uh, and uh, and these uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, intelligence from uh, from you the uh, let's say the uh, uh, the young engineers coming from uh, from you know uh, the best universities uh, uh, in in the uh, in Europe or in the US I think this kind of uh, let's say uh, interaction is very important for us, and that's what we are trying to do. And wh- that's what we call it uh, innovation lab: is to bring, you know, this. And and if we need to, for example, to change, you know, our uh, let's say means, our rules, etc., inside the central bank, we, we are using, you know, these uh, these uh, fintech to uh, to help us to do it. And I think this uh, win-win, uh, uh, let's say, it's very very important. I think the way that we are trying to do right now, it's it's uh, it's uh, 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 understanding, bringing, showing that it's it's working, changing perhaps our rules, our regulatories, giving them the opportunity to work with us and after to work with others, and that's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, the way that uh, we are trying also to to understand and I and I'm sure uh, uh, in one or two years we will uh, we will see a lot of change in the central bank but also in the country because also we will impact. The banking system to change and now. For example, with the establishment of payment, it's very important. We began with two uh, firms; they are not banks. Now we have the uh, the official. Uh, we have the uh, uh, what we call this uh, telco coming, and uh, we have also the uh, the even the what we call the Islamic Bank coming. And I, I'm sure the financial inclusion we cannot solve it with only the banking system, because uh, they are not uh, these, uh, you know, the customers, they're not interested in these customers. For, for the others, I think it's uh, 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 with, uh, with low costs, and I, I'm sure 
using the technology, we can uh, we can uh, bring, as I said, you know, all these uh, pools, all these, uh, let's say, uh, lagged regions, people that were not uh, living in the informal economy, back to the formal economy. But I think that's it's uh, it's not Thank an easy you. task. But that's what trying what we are trying to do. That's very interesting, uh, Governor and. I, I am familiar with how conservative central bankers are and what you're doing by bringing the discussion into the bank and leading the discussion is really very unique and uh, potentially can help you uh, fast track, if I can put it that way, the development of fintech in your country. So thank you for that. If I can turn to Martin and then back to Senator Deacon before we see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, Mr. Rona, you expressed uh, some uh, some concerns about downside risks uh, with respect to open banking. You know, we're talking about, of course, the regulatory environment here. So, presumably, uh, you have some thoughts on what our regulatory framework should look out for in terms of those downside risks. Well, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'm, I was maybe thinking a bit less around the regulatory frameworks uh, and maybe more from a point of view, what is the real intention? Um, my experience um, with, um, uh, with these new technologies has been uh, that it is quite costly um, to implement. And um, uh, in okay in Europe, you have um, probably the thinnest margins in worldwide, especially in Switzerland, where we have negative interest rates, and and so um, you become very cost conscious, and you you have to weigh the, the benefits. And I think there is a bit of a risk that these technologies just become accessible to the very large players, creating a new situation where again um, you have a situation where the winner takes it all um, if they dominate that uh, that technology. Um, again, drawing on um, more my experience in the emerging markets, I just um, last week had the uh, opportunity to speak with a highly successful fintech from Peru. And uh, within um, three years, they had gained 4 million customers and um, they're planning to reach out. They say their universe of customers is about 14 million and they expect to reach 10 million of those within a very short time. And my question then was also, well, um, that's great, it's wonderful, but how did you manage to solve the whole um, know your customer, anti-money laundering, all these issues, which for example, when, when I had to do um, digital onboarding in Switzerland was the biggest headache of all. And basically they, uh, he, they explained to us that um, indeed, um, through the technology, they were able to build in mechanisms um, to identify the people, number one. And number two, uh, the regulator was also willing to be a little bit more lenient because the amounts were so small. So you had exactly that combination, just like um, Governor El Abassi um, told us, of an open-minded regulator and um, these uh, people who know the technology really well coming together and finding very pragmatic solutions. And I think that's what needs to happen. Mm. But the values issue, I don't think you will ever be able to resolve that with, uh, through regulation. We have seen in the financial crisis, um, uh, there was a lot of regulation in place, maybe not enough, but still uh, we had a crisis. We we're moving from one crisis to the next. And I think that, uh, that all the regulation in the world will not solve the value issue. Uh, something else will have to deal with that. Thank you, Martin. And it's a really important reminder about values and, and um, tail risks, I guess, if we can put it that way, which uh, doesn't go away. Uh, if I'm going to turn to Senator Deacon for his thoughts on this issue, but uh, before I do that, I want to remind uh, all the audience that we do have a Q&A uh, feature on this Zoom chat, and if you have questions, you can please, uh, if you would please, put it in the chat box under Q&A, and I'll try and get to it. Colin, uh, what what do you do? I do you worry about um, first mover advantages and creation of, you know. Um, Monopoly power, abuse of power. Do you worry about um, technology over optimism? Uh, what are your thoughts? 
Are you asking that just because you know how optimistic I am? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I'm somebody, I, I, I was most impressed with how Australia came at this. Australia came at it through the perspective of the Australian Productivity Commission examining the need. What are the, what are the uh, strategic legislative moves that they can make in that country to really advance productivity growth in, in Australia? Because we all know productivity growth is such a driver of prosperity. And they found that the ability of, of individuals to control their data was crucial. And the ability of individuals to invest their data in new ways through new services was crucial to the future of their economy. So not acting, uh, in my mind, with digital identity and improvements in, in, in the con consumer's ability to control the use of their data, in my mind, represents an enormous risk. If we do not move towards the use of digital identity, which controls what people can know about you or do know about you for the purpose that they have. Um, and Canada is very close. We've got a, a, a digital identity standard now that has been certified and, and it's, a, it's something to be rolling ahead. It's fantastic. We've got leadership globally in terms of what's happened certainly in GDPR or I think more efficiently uh, through the Consumer Data Rights Act in Australia, but it has limitations as well um, to deal with two very big risks. But the other risk of inaction is a business risk. We've got great banks in this country, but we also have the threat of big tech as everybody does. If we do not move to rapidly digitize the services available to our society so that they have access to credit, access to different services that they don't have access today to today, to reduce the cost of services they are, they are provided, then I think we're leaving the door open for, for foreign entities to come in through the internet to provide services that Canadians are not providing. Uh, Canadian businesses are not providing. And we will lose control of those data in different ways. We will lose the economic benefit. So for me, that's a significant factor. But I also want to go to something, if I could quickly, that, that uh, Leila Wright mentioned earlier. That I'm a huge fan of our competition bureau. And one of the tools that they developed was a step-by-step -step guide. I'm just reading it now for, to competition assessment in Canada. And they identified just a, four simple rules that public servants should be following to assess the, their existing policies and their potential to limit, number one, the ability of businesses to enter and expand in a market or operate across borders as being a, that's a competition risk. The ability of, of for businesses to set up the, the price, the quality, quantity of services or products sold, the, incenti the incentives for that business to compete vigorously or the potential for consumers to switch between competing businesses. If your policy limits any of those, then you are limiting competition and you're limiting access to productivity growth and prosperity in the economy. And they boiled it down to something quite simple and useful that I think is a, is, is a risk that if we don't start to pay attention to in Canada, again, we are undermining our prosperity in the long run. You're on mute, Paul. Thank you, Colin. Uh, th thank you for that. And I wonder if uh, Leila Wright would like to respond to it, specifically the the uh, observation that Senator Deacon made, which is that the anti-competitive risk may not come from the proliferation or from first mover advantages of fintechs, but it comes from big tech muscling in because they are the only game in town and they end up um, dominating the field. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. So maybe I'll start just with the uh, competition assessment toolkit that uh, Senator Deacon mentioned. So this toolkit is something that other countries have also developed uh, in order to ensure that policymakers are taking competition into account. And Australia actually has made it mandatory. So every single policy that goes through um, Australian government requires a competition assessment. They, they did this, you know, several decades ago. Um, and in the 1990s, they did a review to see, you know, what what happened. So we've, we've implemented this mandatory competition assessment. How did that actually affect the economy in Australia? And what they found was that there was, in fact, a 2.5% GDP growth uh, that, that occurred as a result of the competition assessment being mandatory. And that translated in 1990 dollars to an average of $7,000 increase per family across the country. So, I mean, when, when you think about 
what are the what's the potential upside to increasing competition in the marketplace? It's huge, and it's something that everyone should be thinking about. Um, then, when you think about what are the risks of not going forward with open banking, if I if I could again um, speak to some numbers and, and some numbers about the full eco economic benefits. Uh, so the UK has also implemented open banking. Um, and what they found was that it's increased uh, their economy by about $440 million per year. So again, a huge amount. Like, I don't think you even need to get to um, like, like the first mover advantage. You need to just think about um, right now, we need to grow our economy. And that's something that needs to be a priority uh, across Canada. And it's something that competition can really help uh, create. That's super, thank you. Uh, which gets to the phrase that Senator Deacon used to characterize the Canadian situation, that we are fast followers. Presumably, he wants us to be even faster followers. Uh, but uh, that's up to uh, many different players to, to, um, to work on. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A uh, box, and I, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to direct them to specific individuals. Uh, the first question has to do with financial literacy, and if I can just twist the question a little bit, I want to ask um, Governor Alabasi, and maybe I can also put the question to um, uh, Senator Deacon, about the potential for fintechs to be a tool for financial literacy and how would that work and uh, is that one of the major benefits that we might see from the use of fintechs in, in our respective countries? Governor El Abbasi? You're on mute. I think um, uh, I, I agree that the financial literacy is uh, is uh, in, in our countries when we are talking about financial inclusion is because there's a lot of people they are not uh, they they are not uh, let's say uh, living uh, uh, as I said in the, in the formal economy they are out, outside the, you know the the economy being with us with us, with us but not. Uh, Really, uh, you know, using these, uh, let's say, these uh, financial uh, solutions, uh, it's uh, always even even if they get uh, possibilities, you know, to get uh, uh, cash transfers from the government is is always the cash out. And I think uh, we need we need to to talk uh, to to these people. We need uh, to to talk uh, even to the uh, young generation about you know uh, 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 on the. Uh, let's say primary schools, uh, secondary schools. I think it's very important even to to bring to the, let's say this uh, 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 vocabulary about uh, not only fintechs, banks, uh, uh, digital payment, and uh, other capabilities. What we are discovering today is uh, even uh, when uh, people that are not used to technology, they can they are also using you know uh, uh, not iPhone but uh, let's say normal phone without uh, and the technology could help them to do a lot of uh, let's say uh, uh, and to solve a lot of their uh, uh, problems they are doing saving with these phones i think i, I saw a lot of uh, uh, young guys using technology just to to help them uh, to use their uh, let's say uh, very uh, simple phone to get money in and uh, and and to pay uh, you know some of their uh, uh, I think I think needs and uh, and a lot of uh, uh, microcredit uh, now they are uh, using you know this uh, phone and the technology to uh, to to give them opportunities and I I think financial literacy is it's is also that because. Uh, with the phone, with the perhaps uh, they have uh, uh, young guys who are educated. They can, uh, they can, uh, for example, to, for, for their parents, who their, uh, for example, they they don't understand, who they don't read. Then they can help them. I think uh, we need we need to use all these, uh, let's say, technologies around us to 
to to to uh, let's say to uh, to be able to uh, uh, to support you know these uh, let's say uh, 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 population uh, who are excluded yes. to bring uh, this population in uh, in the system and that is part of what normally we should do and uh, and 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 I I think with uh, with the COVID nineteen we were able to do it and to accelerate the process. We have done in 15 days or three weeks with the Minister of, of uh, uh, Information Technology and the Minister of Social Affairs and others, what we were not able to do for two years. That's the acceleration. And now we need, we need to do it more and more and more because we, we saw the impact on these uh, excluded population. Then I think uh, uh, these uh, uh, fintechs, uh, these uh, startup, uh, they 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 could really help and support with using uh, other technologies we are not using right now. Thank you, uh, Colin. If I could ask you to answer briefly, and Very because quick. I have one more question for our two other panelists, is financial literacy a problem in Canada, and can fintechs play a role in solving that? Financial t uh, financial literacy is a problem in every economy without question. And what I like about fintechs is they can provide just-in-time learning. You can learn in context of the problem you need to solve, the problem you're facing today, versus having a li linear access to pro training programs that are out of context and not what you need to know at the moment. And so because these, these platforms know where you're at and what you're dealing with, they can deliver advice in the context of learning that allows you to advance far more rapidly than would otherwise be the case. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from the audience about the divergence between fintechs and traditional banks. And basically the question is whether the traditional banks, if I can put it that way, uh, are able to also use these non-traditional tools that fintechs use for, you know, know your customer, know your, know your vendor, anti-money laundering, uh, monitoring and uh, administration. I wonder if uh, Martin Rona would like to comment on that. You're a former banker. Uh, are the traditional banks also using the new tools available to them? Um, I'm sure there are some. Uh, and in principle, sorry, I still have a lot of background noise. Uh, in principle, it is possible. Uh, so that is not a, um, a, an issue. I think the issue is more whether the banks um, are as nimble and as uh, competent and also have the culture to adapt those skills as quickly as the fintechs um, are doing. Because I think fintech or this whole technology issue has very much also to do with a way of thinking with a uh, corporate culture. And so I think um, at this stage, many banks are still much more in the old ana analogous way of looking uh, at these challenges. But in principle, yes, it's possible. And some banks are making use of it. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Leila Wright, would you like to comment on that question or give us any final thoughts? Final no. thoughts. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that right now we're, we are in a situation where the government's trying to do two things at once. They're trying to respond to a global health pandemic, and they're also trying to figure out what to do next. So how do we engage in economic recovery? And that is all about growing the economy. And I think that, um, increasing productivity through things such as increasing competition, um, finding ways to get policymakers across the country to really understand why competition is important, why that needs to be a central um, aspect of any kind of policy going forward. I think those are things that we as a competition bureau are going to be very focused on um, in the coming months, coming years. Um, and very much appreciate being invited to a panel like this to speak about it. No, thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, we're approaching the end of our time for this first panel. We started with a discussion on financial inclusion broadly and the idea of open banking as a solution for financial inclusion. Uh, we've kind of landed at a place where 
Competition is also a solution. It's part of the same package of solutions for financial inclusion. And in the case of Canada, it's a solution in part because it also enhances productivity and economic growth for the country. Of course, uh, Canada's problems are very different from the problems faced by other countries, particularly in the developing world. But some of our discussion has already touched on issues that connect industrialized countries and developing countries. We've already, particularly uh, Governor El Abbasi's comments on uh, small money transfers uh, and uh, the uh, regulatory regime for anti-money laundering and combating the financing, financing of terrorism. That's already come up. Uh, the question of uh, payments um, technology, um, uh, the question of know your customer, know your vendor. Uh, all of this uh, is a wonderful segue and transition to our second panel. And I'm just looking at my screen to make sure that our panelists have joined. I hope they were able to uh, take part in uh, and listen in to some of the previous discussion. And uh, I want to, before I move to the next panel, I want to thank once again Senator Deacon, uh, Martin Rona, Governor El Abbasi, Deputy Commissioner Leila Wright, for your really illuminating, really helpful comments. I hope you can stay, don't feel obliged to, but uh, thank you so much. And uh, with the end of one sub panel, we move immediately to our second panel. Uh, for those of you who are only just joining us or who have joined recently, you will allow me, I hope, to do a quick recap of where we are. Uh, this is the virtual Victoria Forum organized by the University of Victoria and uh, in part supported by the Senate of Canada. I am a member of the Senate of Canada. I'm Yun Pao Wu. I'm a senator representing British Columbia. It's my honor to be the moderator for uh, both the previous panel and this one. The previous panel uh, you will have picked up already focused on the question of open banking uh, and some of the regulatory challenges to open banking uh, as a tool for financial inclusion. There was a little bit of a focus on Canada which has its own financial inclusion problems, but we're now going to talk about financial inclusion challenges that are of a different order and depending on what you say, of a different, uh, of a different quality. The particular focus uh, for this panel is uh, financial inclusion in developing countries, developing regions, but uh, more specifically, the role of small money transfers, uh, remittances, and the use of fintech in enabling these transfers to help overcome uh, financial inclusion. Uh, we have another very distinguished panel with us uh, for the second panel.